Hey there, I'm Christopher Schoenwald, and welcome to Life As A, a show intently focused on helping people find their professional pathway by exploring and unearthing the details of jobs from around the world. For listeners who have been tuning in regularly, you've probably noticed I've got this little spiel off the top where I'm asking people to go over to YouTube. I have a channel over there, Life As A, dot, dot. And basically, it's just highlights from the main audio versions, from the podcast versions of these talks that I have with these great guests. And the reason I'm plugging it so hard is that I think this content really does matter. And I want to get it in front of people. I want to get in front of youth, people that are still undecided, who just don't know what they want to do with their lives. And I think this platform, you know, one YouTube offers that opportunity kind of get up close and personal with some of these guests in a different format. And if you're just not into audio, if you're not into podcasting as a whole, that's fine. That's okay. Well, you can still digest the content in a different way. I would encourage you, if you do know somebody who's looking for that career, looking for some ideas, direct them over to lifeasa.dot over on YouTube. You know, if they're into videos, they might just find what they're looking for over there. And while you are there, hey, I would always appreciate a like or subscribe. It's the best way to let that algorithm know that the content matters, that it should be put in front of others. Well, I do thank you for letting me ask this of you, but I think it's about time we get into today's episode. I got to confess, I was thinking about jobs the other day, you know, as I'm apt to do on this program. And what I was thinking about specifically was that it's incredibly difficult to get into space science and space research, you know, just even space exploration. How do you get into all of that? Well, you might assume you get that advanced degree from one of the top universities, and then you make your way to these limited set of potential employers. If you're like me, you might consider a place like NASA, or maybe even SpaceX, or some other billionaire-led pet project. However, what happens if you are coming from a country that's not America? You know, university options are limited, course options are limited. How do you make your way into space science, space research, space exploration? Yeah, not so easy, right? That's what I thought at least. That was until I had this great conversation with this wonderful guest. His name is Dr. Jason Remiller. I'm going to introduce you to him shortly. But basically, he founded the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences. It's a nonprofit research and education organization. And basically, they provide educational services, research opportunities in things like aeronomy, bioastronautics, microgravity science, things that directly lead into, again, this world of space science and space research. And not only that, They welcome people from over 50 different countries from around the world. I mean, this conversation was so, so utterly fascinating. We get into the actual organization he founded. We get into his past, why he did all this, and also the importance of his work. You know, what it means, what it means to people that are involved within it, but also what it means to humanity moving forward. And most importantly, we get into his work. You know, what are his big responsibilities? What are some of the other opportunities that people can expect when they go through some of these courses? You know, that is unto itself, I think, valuable to anyone who has an interest in this world of space science, space research, and so on. And also, I might add, he has this awesome, awesome story that you don't want to miss. It's, uh, yeah, well, I'm not going to say too much more about it, but you just have to tune in for it. Let me more formally introduce you to our guest today, and we can jump right into all of this. Dr. Jason Remuller is the founder and currently serves as the executive director of International Institute for Astronautical Sciences, IIAS, an advocate for science participation and literacy. He has also co-founded three outreach programs. Possum 13 serves young women, Out Astronaut serves LGBTQ+, and Space for All Nations serves emerging space nations. Now, having traveled to over 70 different countries, he has found space to be a bridge that transcends cultural and national divides. Today, IIAS serves members from over 50 different countries and has become the world's first institutional sponsor of a commercial human-tended research spaceflight. 
Founded in 2015, the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences is a 501c3 nonprofit research and education organization with licensure from the state of Connecticut providing educational services and research opportunities in, get ready for this, aeronomy, bioastronautics, microgravity science, spacesuit evaluation, operational science, and flight test engineering through partnerships with the National Research Council of Canada, Florida Tech, Survival Systems USA, NAUI, and the Canadian Space Agency. Prior to founding IIAS, Dr. Miller served for six years as a system engineer and project manager for NASA's Constellation program, leading studies on launch aborts, launch commit criteria, post-landing and emergency crew egress trades, and propulsion options. Dr. Miller has also served NASA as co-principal investigator of the PMC Turbo Experiment. Further, he's been a commissioned officer of the U.S. Air Force, and finally, he also works as a commercial research pilot and NAUI scuba instructor. As for education, get ready for this. Dr. Vermiller holds a Ph.D. in aerospace engineering sciences from the University of Colorado in Boulder, a master's in science degree in physics from San Francisco State University, a master's in science degree in aviation systems from the University of Tennessee, a master's in science degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Colorado, and a bachelor of science degree in aerospace engineering from the Florida Institute of Technology. So with all of these things noted, I'd like to welcome you to my conversation with Dr. Jason Rimmuller. Yeah, so welcome to the program. How are you doing today, Jason? Hey, thanks, Chris. We're doing all right. Good to be with you. Yeah, really excited for this conversation for a number of different reasons. Uh, the work that you do just sounds absolutely fascinating. You know, several other adjectives I could probably throw in there as well. But uh, I do thank you for taking some time here. I do have this first segment lined up. It's something called Coloring Wikipedia. And it's a segment where I just read off a definition of what the guest does, the field of study sometimes, or, you know, the, the area that they're involved in. And the idea here is to, you know, for better or worse, color it a little bit more. And these definitions on Wikipedia, sometimes they hit, sometimes they encompass all of the elements, and sometimes they don't. So I'd love to hear your take on astronautics. So let me just read that off for you, and then uh, maybe you comment. Does that sound all right? Sounds good. All right, here we go. Astronautics. Astronautics, or cosmonautics, is the theory and practice of travel beyond Earth's atmosphere into outer space. Spaceflight is one of its main applications and space science its overarching field. Space science encompasses all of the scientific disciplines that involve space exploration, study, natural phenomena, and physical bodies occurring in outer space, such as space medicine and astrobiology. There it is, a bit of a mouthful. Got through, I didn't stumble this time. But uh, first take, what do you think of that? Well, I think the description is fairly accurate. I would uh, emphasize that you know, astronautics focuses on human ad- adaptation to space. There's so many things involved with human exploration, but then it's combined with scientific inquiry. You know, what are we learning? What are humans doing to complement what robotics are doing? That's a long decision of the value of spaceflight. But when you look at the research, it's not just what the human is doing, but the human itself as a, as a test subject, as like anything. Yeah. Um, what can we learn about space medicine and a lot of things that that go with that. We'll get into this later, but I, there's a lot of social impacts that can be involved from, from big picture. And ultimately, it comes down to doing science, but not just the science of understanding outer space or deep space. Uh, most of what we know about our own planet comes from space platforms. So you know, it's it's always interesting that you know, the farther you look outward, it, it creates more questions of you know, our origin, our planet in itself. Yeah, I really like that point. That last point you just added in there, you know, the, the the more you get into it, the more questions that you have. I mean, space research, I suppose. I mean, our, our whole exploration of space has been going on for quite some time. But as we, we as humans, how we're adapting, how we're changing, how our technology is changing does create more questions. It creates new variables in a sense, I would assume, for us to test. You know, we have new, better improved you know, systems, perhaps, or you know, some of the, the tools that we're using, how do they respond within space? It's, it's never ending, I guess, right? Indeed. 
Yeah, yeah, which would be, you know, quite interesting, I would assume, being involved in that line of work. I mean, it's it's never ending. Your, your curiosity is always being piqued by all these possibilities. So, okay. Was there anything in that definition that you would de-emphasize or? Well, you know, the, uh, the astronaut himself or herself literally touches on everything. Uh, you know, you think of someone that's truly a, an ambassador to STEM, you know, the, so many elements of science and research and and uh, anything from aerospace medicine to engineering and science operations, et cetera, you look at what the astronaut represents and it's someone that's very skilled, that has expertise that's needed, but someone has these broad skills and can adapt and work with so many different things, which makes them such an important spokesperson to a variety of science. And you look at impact people can have and how people can inspire you know, this this persona is so socially transformative uh, because of their ability to inspire and their, because of their ability to talk on so many levels of science, you know, be an ambassador to STEM, you know, someone that can really talk as a truly international persona as well. Yeah, definitely. You know, we were fortunate enough on Life As uh, to welcome a former astronaut, Terry Verts. He was a International Space Station commander. And yeah, exactly what you're saying there, an ambassador for, you know, the field of of STEM and science and space research, and just the perspectives in that conversation. So really quickly, I mean, for listeners who are interested in in this conversation, you might want to check that one out again. Terry Verts is his name. Really, really engaging talk there. But maybe we could get back to this one and transition into a new segment here, Jason, a day in the life. And I do have to say that usually when I have guests on this program, you know, just from general knowledge standpoint, I have an idea of what a possible day in the life could look like. But you had me stumped. I mean, and when I was considering the line of work that you're involved in, in IIAS, like I, I could not come up with anything. So I'm really, really excited to hear from a general standpoint, you know, what is it that, that you're involved with on a daily, weekly basis? I don't think I have a day that's like any others. And, and uh, so, so much is improving as things come. You know, the, the the pace of things in the industry moves so quick and and the institute moves so quickly in terms of opportunities and and what our members bring, opportunities that come with us that we really have to be responsive. So, you know, serving this community, serving this institute is you know, the greatest privileges of my life. And I'm very grateful for this uh every day. Uh you know, I serve as the executive director. So a lot of my life is sitting on my butt in the coffee house and writing emails, <laughs> things like that. Um, you know, strategic partnerships and, you know, kind of telling the story and making sure that the, you know, the mission is being communicated well and that the, the working groups and everyone's getting what they need and the, the science, you know, the um, education programs extend from the outreach programs that we do. The core mission of, of what we do uh, stays in a line and the values that we base from that and the actions that then we trace to our, our values. But that said, I still teach or co-instruct three courses. And a lot of our directors are also instructors. And so we're a very matrixed organization. You know, we're not as hierarchical as, as you would think. We're, you know, very much a family in this. And, and that's what's so special is it's so international. We have active members, students from 54 different countries. And you think that all these cultural differences would make things complicated, but space is a culture and it's a community. It's a bridge that brings people together. And you find that, you know, we're not, we're not that different after all. And you think managing a group with so many cultural diversities would be a challenge. And uh, you find at the, at the core that, that it's really not. So there's a lot of, a lot of that, but, you know, we have in-person elements, we have campaigns, we have three semesters. And they culminate, many courses culminate in an intensive that the last month and a half of the spring semester, maybe a month in the summer and a month and a half in the fall, you know, we're off to the different uh, campuses that we have or places for research, you know, Saturday going out to Arizona and then to Florida for our course. I still teach uh, our basic course, Fundamentals of Astronautics. I co-instruct with that. I help teach our flight test engineering program. So I'm a uh, one of the flight test instructors and kind of demonstrate different ways of qualifying novel aircraft uh, with students in the aircraft. So to demonstrate, uh, and that's a part of our program because of its ability to mix science, engineering, and operations. And I also teach a course once a year on spacecraft egress and rescue operations. And, and so uh, 
I always enjoy that one because that's such a complicated problem. You have to consider anything and everything that can go wrong in a mission that's going to put you in some kind of post-landing environment. And, and that these situations drive and design trades of entire vehicle architectures. So, so I enjoy teaching these and, and working at each of the research campaigns and getting my hands on novel programs and help focus this. But you know, things, again, change so quickly. So I don't know what to say about a day in the life. I try to delegate and hand things off, but sometimes we we're, we grow so quickly that we're bringing in more things quicker than I can delegate them. <laughs> Good problems to have, I suppose, though. Yeah, Indeed. yeah. Well, it sounds interesting in the sense that like you're touching on so many different areas constantly. I think that's one of the patterns that comes up with you know individuals that are finding levels of success, at least the ones that I've spoken to on this program, is that you're not just doing the same thing over and over and over again. The mundane doesn't enter too often, you know, and if it does, it's, it's not around for very long. And uh, I think that's one of the secrets right there of, of finding, once again, some degree of fulfillment. And, you know, for you, like that aspect of teaching as well, giving back, I think that's a, a big one. You know, you, you can you know, see how some of your knowledge is passed on and how somebody else can take it on and, and probably for yourself, you know, learning from the students as well their perspectives or their views. I mean, that's one of the joys of teaching. It's not just that one way exchange, you know, it's, it's both ways in that sense. So yeah, I could see a few different touch points there where you would be gaining a, a sense of, you know, fulfillment, satisfaction from the work that you do. Uh, we do have another segment where we're going to get into, you know, the organization itself, where you can explain a little bit more about what you do. But before we get into that, I kind of want to rewind a second here in this other segment called Pathways. And it's a segment to illustrate, you know, how guests ended up where they ultimately landed within their professions or businesses. And off the top, I introduced to listeners this wide array of professional experiences and academic achievements that you've been part of. Again, I think it's interesting to, to go back into the past before all of these things, you know, came together. And I, I would assume that the work that you're doing, you know, being inquisitive is part and parcel of what you do. That's another big element, I would think. But first question here, were you always just naturally curiously minded in that sense? It's a hard question to answer. I never really know where things get seated. Uh, now, I have to say, I grew up very close with my grandfather. You know, for He was an Air Force general. In fact, if anyone, one of the ways I, I often introduce myself, um, if anyone has read Catch-22, it was a a, a satire of the Second World War and it became very popular. And Joseph Heller, the author, served under my grandfather in the war. Oh, wow. And afterwards, he based all the actual people on the, 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 the fictional people in his book on the actual people he'd served with. Well, my granddad was fictionalized as Colonel Cathcart, who was the chief antagonist of the book. So, <laughs> uh, and so I go. always appreciated the the uh, the book. I don't think my granddad did as much. He <laughs> no, I was about to say he service. probably didn't. Yeah, but I also appreciated the, the satire of it. So that's the kind of environment I grew up in. And I look back and you think of the sources of privileges and the sources of challenges. But I think my biggest privilege is growing up in a house full of books and you know my grandfather and people that had the time to expose me to things. And so I think that you know kind of seeds a curiosity. And then combine that and that time with the Apollo program was, you know, was very inspiring to me. And it, it, I learned very from a young age the value of you know, education, the value of you know, science and things. It seeded a, a curiosity. There were so many things about that that you know, I've always felt like the only kid in the nonfiction section in the library. But later in life, I think that was very motivational because I want to see more people with that opportunity. You know, that's kind of inspiration and get it you know getting involved with that and if there's opportunities so that so that you know every every family that every person that comes imagine what if every family had a citizen scientist you know not even professionals somebody that's active in that and that can relate to their their family their community or so think about you know, the greatest threats that that face us and lack of understanding about the most critical things like climate change and yeah, a lot of this comes from just a fundamental misunderstanding or miscommunication or, uh, you know, so getting people involved in the, the scientific process, whether it's as a professional science or as meaningful contributions to routes of citizen science or science communicators, you know, somehow can we build a science or science participatory, science literate culture 
it's very important. And I think it traces back to those initial opportunities that I had and the, the question that you first asked. So, so I think having that scientific inquiry, you know, how can we how can we spark that in more people? And I feel grateful to to have been to have grown up in a country that had an active space program. And now you see more and more countries getting involved with this, and it's exciting. One of the projects we just uh you know, we we're, we're excited to see was a group in, in Guatemala that launched their first national satellite. And uh, you, know, you, you think of this and, and, and the impact that that can produce, you know, people start to wonder why. And, you know, now in a country, your, your heroes just aren't the, the footballers. Your heroes are now the scientists. And that, that creates, that builds your middle class, that builds, that builds a, a, a good society. It sounds like to me it was somewhat mission driven in that sense. You're recognizing these things and the value of of some of some of the points that you're just speaking of. But really quickly, I'm curious about you know your stated interest in science from a, a young age, and then even like your attraction to space science. You know, and the Apollo program and what was going on there. Was there a moment? Was there something that pushed you to the point where I want to be involved in that world, in that particular facet or area within science, within space science? Was there anything there that pushed you in that direction? You know, that's that's a difficult question because as long as I can remember, I think from three years old, that's I knew I wanted to be an astronaut. And I meet people in our program that have similar uh, interests or some that have been inspired later in life, however it comes about. So, you know, I, I think my relation to space and astronautics has changed. I think from a you know in a young age it was just cool. You know, wanted to, this is what I wanted to do because it looks amazing. And I think you know as you become you know more mature and more socially aware of certain things, you, you start to realize other things that that means and and the impacts, social impacts that that touches on broadly. So my relation to that has changed, but I don't think the focus itself has ne- necessarily swayed too far from that. All right. Well, maybe we could return to the present here and shift into yet another segment of Q&A discovery. We can kind of continue this back and forth just as we've been doing. And I think it might be an opportune time to learn more about the IIAS, uh, the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences, this nonprofit that you founded. And uh, I understand that it's you know, based around educational services and research opportunities in aeronomy, bioastronautics, microgravity science, spacesuit evaluation, operational science, flight test engineering. There could be a few more things I'm sure there are, but um, maybe you could speak to this a little bit more and, and let listeners know about the work that you guys do. Well, that that is a lot. And I think you captured at least the breadth at present, but this all grew from a research project. You know, this, the Institute Grew from my, my doctoral dissertation, and I came in with a background of uh, flight test. You know, I kind of followed my granddad and loved to uh, to fly, and um, and then also uh, it was a study of uh, noctilucent clouds, and these were uh, clouds that are in the upper mesosphere, like maybe about ten times higher than the typical clouds you see, and I instantly piqued my interest because, you know, they're kind of a near space phenomenon. You could see them in polar regions and maybe I could fly to study them. And those were, you know, that got me in right away. <laughs> but they also, I came to appreciate that they're they're very tied to the atmosphere as a whole. And that's a, a really good indicator of things like global climate change. So I realized that a lot of people didn't know anything about it. So the initial experiment was to, to extend upon what I did for a dissertation and I modified a small plane with some instruments and I would fly in a way that would intercept an overpass of a satellite that was studying these from space. And from the airborne imagery I could get from the plane, we were looking at the threshold of the imagery of the features of this cloud to try to understand how the solar environment, you know, the lowest level of the ionosphere was interacting with the highest levels of the terrestrial energy, you know, the energy and momentum that was being convected up and this process of things called gravity waves. And what we thought was we knew very little of in the mesosphere, people would jokingly call it the ignorosphere. Actually, we realized that, no, this is anything but. This is the most sensitive part of our planet. This is the most dynamic part of the planet. And if you really want to understand our atmosphere as a whole, this is where you can do this. And if you want to understand things like global climate change, we'll see atmosphere that we affect directly. and 
all of that plays out into the melting glaciers and the rainforest and all the effects, but it's the atmosphere that we affect, and it's the upper atmosphere that's the most sensitive. So we needed to put a, a stop to the ignorosphere. So we put a proposal in to NASA in 2012, and it was accepted under the flight opportunities. And the, the idea was to take one of these vehicles they were making for tourism, you know, these suborbital flights, turn it into an aronomy laboratory. Aronomy being the study of the upper atmosphere that we could do like meter resolution imagery and combine it with in situ observations of temperatures and particles and really try to characterize this environment. So that was exciting, but you needed a trained operator. You couldn't automate the experiment very well. It was a bit of an art. So at the time, there was only kind of one person that had some experience, and that was myself. And we realized, wow, there's an opportunity to really get people involved and expose them to all the things that go to a scientific mission plan. You know, not just the the subject matter and the clouds and the environment in which they are, but the the techniques of remote sensing and observations and how the human works in that. All of this, you know, the this atmospheric scattering, the solar mechanics, there's so many things that go into this. And like, wow, this is an it would be an incredible program. So we started that. And this was back in had a first class in 2012. Uh, we called it Project Possum. That was a acronym for Polar Suborbital Science in the Upper Mesosphere. And that stayed on as our aronomy project. And, and the idea is, you know, we had to develop an instrument, an instrument that one could control using a, an IVA spacesuit. So that started another relation. <laughs> so all of a sudden, now we were working with spacesuits, and the company we were working with got a, a Space Act agreement with NASA. So now we started maturing the technologies with them. So we started working with microgravity experiments. That started a relation with the National Research Council of Canada. That opened up all this network of relations there. So now we're doing bioastronautics and spacesuit evaluation, microgravity science, and those relations and with the, the relations that we'd worked with the Canadian Space Agency and then and the Canadian Air Force, I had a degree in, in uh, flight test engineering, and all of a sudden we had a whole bunch of people involved in that. And so we brought that into the program as well. So the research programs that we do, you know, we're in the um, process of, of accreditation now for a uh, master's in astronomical sciences, but these these foundations, you know, veronomy and, and operational science and bioastronautics and flight tests and our professional certificates as well. So all of this really grew very quickly by just everything that that particular experiment touched on. And the people that came in, many, many of the people ended up becoming instructors or directors. And so we're a very grassroots movement uh, from that. Most people that teach came through this Fundamentals of Astronautics course. Pardon the pun, but it sounds like a complete black hole. <laughs> you, so, you found yourself sucked into with this initial experiment, and it just expanded out into all these different you know, other possibilities. And I think it's a good point or a good way of looking at how a passion-driven initiative can really explode if you know, you, you've taken the blinders off and you're open to different opportunities and you're looking you know, for, for different ways of, of moving projects or moving ideas forward. And uh, it's a perfect example of all of those things, I would think. Well, we have an amazing team. I like to just say I heard the cats and tell the stories of things, but uh, you know, we have a you know space medicine project, uh, and that, we have a course going a couple of ways. It's, it's so many things cross cut through everything, and it's um, you know a lot of times you just you know, have to trust your team and kind of let let people um, kind of weave their own vision and passion into this. Absolutely. There's another point that you raised uh, earlier on in our conversation, and it's this notion of citizen science initiatives. And uh, this, this is basically an underpinning of what IAS represents. And maybe you could break that down once again, of what, what that means you know, for listeners, this citizen science initiative. And then also maybe you could share a little bit more about some of the other projects that you're working on. You just mentioned that POSSUM, the Polar Suborbital Science in the Upper Mesosphere. But I understand that you have another one called Otter. Maybe we could hear a little bit about that too. Sure. And yeah, we like to personify research projects. Uh, but let me step back a little bit about citizen science, because I think we're trying to maybe redefine a little bit about what people think about citizen science. So, you know, I, I always look at at the work that that we all do with IIAS as activism. And I don't think I don't think I could 
I can do this in any other way. Uh, you know, entrepreneurship is, it can be exhausting. It's, it, uh, in some ways can be a very difficult life, but it can also be incredibly rewarding. And, you know, you, you look for purpose and intention and ways to make impacts that keeps you going. So having a good overall mission of what you're doing always reminds you of having people whose lives are affected by this is very validating when they, you know, when they share those stories back with you. So we have three core values, science, stewardship, and inclusion. And I can touch on those. You talked about citizen science. So science, you know, what do we mean by that? Like, how do we, again, be a more science participatory culture? Well, there is this persona of the astronaut. Again, that's incredibly inspiring and can get people uh, from all walks of life into different aspects of science. And so, you know, we want to emphasize that as much as we can, but create opportunities, reduce the barriers that exist, eliminate the barriers. So physical access, you know, things that we have as an institute that don't exist anywhere else, you know, like uh, the spacesuits, prototype, you know, actual spacesuits that that we use in, in the program, a gravity offset laboratory, uh, for one, access to research uh, parabolic flight, a number of things that that we uh, want to provide to people around the world. Um, we can do that, I think, to people from all but seven countries. <laughs> Some of the technologies are still controlled. But it's not just a physical access because there has to be economic access too. So when we start a new program in a facility, you know, can we create a facility that you know people can access uh, through a course that would be on par with like a three-credit course at a public university? Because you know we're not talking about space for all, if you, only a few people can afford this, you know, the costs are still very real. Um, and we, we try to challenge that. But if we really want to affect this industry, there's incredible opportunity now. The cost access to space, more countries are getting involved. And this is something that is going to change the world. But at the same time, if people just see space as something for the elite, they see it as joy rides for billionaires, for people that have money or influence, then we lose everything that space has historically meant. You know, the people that that grew up from any walk of life could aspire to be an astronaut. They didn't have to be rich. They just had to be good. They had to have, they had to be the kind of person. They had to have the skills, They'd be the kind of person a nation would invest to its most daring initiatives. That astronauts are what we want as a role model. You know, these people with a sense of self, these global people, these merit-based people, these inspiring people like we need more of that and we, we need to counter that narrative so people don't think that this is an elitist pursuit so how do we do that we do that by creating avenues for anyone to be a professional so that they can demand their seat at the table they don't have to ask a rich person <laughs> they can they have they will have skills that will influence this industry so uh creating an institute that's open internationally creating opportunities for people to be able to get the exposure and skills to become professionals. You know, we talk about investments in education. I'm all for paying teachers. I'm all for building schools, but it has to be real. Like people need their hands on things. We need to invest in facilities that are open so people can innovate and create, like having access to parabolic flight or getting to work in spacesuits. All of a sudden they're designing these things and they learn things so much more naturally when the learning is kinesthetic in that process. So, so we talk about science. Yeah, we, we want to inspire people to science. We want people to go to university and be a PhD. But we also want people that may have other focus or interests or constraints on their time to still realize that they can produce professional, peer-reviewed science through avenues of citizen science, that big money universities don't have monopoly on this. The science just has to be good novel, peer-reviewed. And so the citizen scientists, you know, there's this perception of just people laboring away to get data for that ivory tower scientist. And we need to change that too, because a citizen scientist can be valid in what they do independently of an institution. And so creating access to facilities that enable innovation. And we, even students that come in as young as 18 or 19 years old, we have a, a very serious talk and like, look, you know, you are matrixed with 
subject matter experts. You can come up with an idea. You can publish as a PI, as a, as a high school student, as, as, a, as a freshman, as a sophomore, get an undergrad program in the world if you can do that. So that's the kind of message that we want when we talk about citizen science is getting people to own an investigation, to move on their, their scientific uh, curiosity. So that's what we talked about science, stewardship, the internationalism, the bridges that space build, things that touch on us globally, you know, the uh, global climate being multiplanetary species, things that bring us together, uh, we emphasize, and then inclusion. And that's the genesis of three outreach programs that help serve people and are championed by people that come from underrepresented minorities in STEM. We've got uh, a Possum 13 for girls and young women. We have Out Astronaut for LGBTQ. And we have Space for All Nations uh, for people that come from emerging space nations and that want to amplify their impact in the communities from which they come. No, I, I really like that. And I really appreciate hearing all of that. I think, one, it, it's, it's really useful for for young people who are considering this field. And I think like most people would just, you know, assume that there's two ways into it. One is to be going in through a program like NASA and finding your way through that. Uh, and then the other, like you said, that elitist sort of approach. If you're born into money, that's your other pathway into space. But having this other avenue to explore, having this other way of, of looking at it, you know, it, it opens things up. And, uh, you know, I, there's power in that, certainly. There's power in that. And in the spirit of what this program is all about, I think it, it fits perfectly that way, where like there are so many other different avenues to explore. And the programs that you're just speaking of, you know, really add possibility to people who are motivated to explore these avenues. So I really like that. And I understand here, I have this other question. In terms of your own background, you know, getting back to to NASA itself, you spent, I think, what was it, six years at NASA doing some work there uh, involved in studies on launch aborts, launch commit criteria, amongst many other things. And I'd be curious about some of the experiences that you picked up there that helped you, you know, launch what you're doing right now with IIAS, you know, some of the, the, the learning, some of the ways of, of doing things, how that sort of followed you over into your present day endeavors. You know, it was I was grateful to have had the opportunity at NASA, um, and I think getting involved with so many different people and expertise was very helpful. I, I worked at a what we call level two. It was like the the broadest program level, you know, architecture trades. You know, what are our gaps of understanding? How do we bring projects together that need to be integrated horizontally? And so. Dealing with things like uh, contingency analysis, uh, ascent aborts, all of these have impact. And you look at space architecture, everything that goes together to to enable a, a mission. When you look into this, you're designing this around the sum of your credible contingencies. It's never that perfect mission, but it's also not the bad day on top of the bad day on top of the bad day. And so... As we get into commercial space, it's been very interesting because commercial companies don't want to to show things. You look at the you know, look at the spacesuits that, that SpaceX is using. There's no consideration for post landing survivability at all. You know the image there is, of course, we're not going to end up in the water. Well, if you launch from the United States, your ascent ground track is going to be over water, and by an order of magnitude, your risk is is confined to that first eight minutes. So if you're going to have a problem, you're probably you're going to end up in water. So you should design around that. So there is an image that is that is being played out in commercial space that's different uh, than, than how it has historically been. So it's been very interesting to have the breadth of experience uh, to work at the program level. And then the uh, some of the experts that was able to work with have since been very active in IIS, uh, you know, starting with the late Don Hamill, Ken Trujillo, most notably, and his fingers in so many things with astronaut training and system engineering. And now is, we're able to preserve that within IIS. Yeah, I think the flexibility, I, I was working uh, remotely before it was really that common to work remotely, uh, go maybe to Houston about every week, but I... I started working when I was on the field in Greenland, and so working remotely from there. So I figured that was a pretty good precedence to set. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. You also touched upon, I mean, the the experience at NASA as far as you know the the different types of people, you know, different backgrounds, and you've already mentioned that within your own organization of you know, the people that you work with, and then also the students who are who are you know participating in your programs. And 
I'm wondering if that was an element that you picked up upon as well, that, that was something that you purposely wanted to integrate to make sure that it was, you know, your organization itself was representative of all these different ideas and people. Yes. I think most importantly, system engineering and program management was very creative. And I think I, I learned to appreciate that in, in music and in, in improvisation. My personal friend is a NASA astronaut and a jazz musician, uh, Winston Scott, and we talk on this thing quite often. And and so the uh, you think of system engineering, yeah, there's rigid ways of analyzing things that are mathematical and logical. But, you know, we talk about going to Mars. Well, that knowledge exists here. How do we take the the totality of human experience and find things that are good analogs? And that's creative. So like music, where you have this left and right brain fusion, system engineering was very much the same. Like, how do we ask the right questions? Is there value in this as an analog? I remember we were trying to figure out like the impacts of someone being injured on landing. Well, of course, if they're injured, okay, that's one thing. But if now they're injured and they have a post-landing problem where they have to get out of the vehicle, well, maybe now their broken arm can't allow them to get out. So what's the probability of injuring someone? Uh, well, I mean, we can't, we can't run a test like that. <laughs> so, but we, you know, we got together and thought, and uh, the most useful data came from a uh, NASCAR. Well, naively thought NASCAR was just a big spectacle to sell cheap beer. And I was totally wrong uh, because they came in with this amazing polar, polar graph of the radii was the G forces of every car impact. And the angle, the azimuth was the angle in which the car was hit. And the color was if there was an injury or not and the severity of the injury. All the data was here. Like we could tie that together and design seats and look at environmental models if you hit a side of a hill or on a wave or something like that. And so, you know, that's an example of something like this knowledge exists. And how do we find this and how do we defend the assumptions for using these analogs? How fascinating. How absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And uh, you can definitely see that, that that creative side or even, even like non-science sort of background in that way, connecting up, just being creative enough or, you know, thinking out of the box in, in ways of trying to connect up some of these ideas and, and find new sources of data for the objectives that you have in some of these projects that you're involved with. Okay. All right. This is the last question here before we transition to yet another segment. Yeah, I can see just looking at, you know, the the, the breadth of what you're involved in these different types of projects being really meaningful. And I'd love to know, like in reflecting on this yourself over the course of your career, what, what has all of this added up to for you personally, you know, in terms of maybe a philosophical look at, at the work that you're doing? Yeah, I, I think, I think a lot of it comes to service. You know, when you, when you can do something that is meaningful and touches people or empowers them in some way, I think that that's uh it's important. I think with so many things going on, it's easy to be angry. And I see this happen to so many good people and they're just almost incapacitated because, you know, they see the the climate disintegrating and, they, you know, there's so many things socially that they're, you know, people are being disenfranchised and it's, it's easy just to be angry. And I think, you know, being able to focus on something where, you know, you're, you're sharing your experience as best you can to hopefully inspire someone or enable them to uh, to go off on something, something that is, you know, meaningful like that. And sometimes it's not just in a professional ways, like sometimes it's, you know, you know, it's personal, you know, and it's just, it's hard sometimes when you, when you see this and, you know, how just a little bit can make such big impacts. We had a, an out astronaut uh, uh, contest winner who uh, confided that was one of the first times he, felt that kept respect from family and like, uh, you know, things you would never even, you know, really think about while you're doing something. And then people come back and tell you what it, what it, uh, what it really means, you know, a little investment of a uh, possum 13 winner. Uh, she took her experiments and those of the other finalists and joined us on a campaign. Well, she traveled all over Colombia and shared about not just what a girl could do, but you know, what a Colombian person could do. And that, that's transformative and we realize that, you know, the, the networks that we have, you know, they're so much more than any specific elements, you know, there's this, this kind of feedback that, that is, uh, you know, the, that keeps us going. 
Yeah, most definitely. I mean, how could that not affect you positively in some capacity there? When you're seeing, like you said, that that word of transformative change or the opportunity for that to take place in, in, in other people's lives, you inspiring them to, to get involved and to make a difference. Because you're right. I mean, it is so easy to get jaded about things in, in the state of the world right now in a lot of different respects. But if you can focus in on these sort of like micro interactions that you're having and then, you know, the possibilities how they can explode out further and touch several other people and inspire them to do some things that can counteract some of the challenges that we're facing. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I do have this other segment here, Jason, a water cooler story. And it's basically based around the idea of the guest sharing a story related to their work and something about it that that stuck out across their career. You know, with the work that you do being so intriguing and, and inspiring in a lot of respects, I'd love to hear what you have for us today. Well, we've been so philosophical in a way, and I think that's important. I'll tell you a funny story. So uh, we were doing a, a microgravity campaign, and we were evaluating spacesuits. And to do a spacesuit test, there's so many integrated systems and crew training. You have you know, a person that was in the suit, and she had already swallowed a pill that was to broadcast core body temperature, and we had her all wired up and everything, and we had the team ready to go. And we just did our test readiness review. Everything was set. Uh, we were going to have what we call step. It's when you, when you're no kidding, get on the plane and go fly at 8 a.m. in the morning. The, the main component, the one that we thought was so robust that we didn't have a backup system, failed. And it was like 5 p.m. We're in Ottawa. And we're like, what are we going to do? Like, we're supposed to fly in the morning. And we have this, this big green air pump that, that fed the whole system. And so we didn't know. So we got everyone together. All of a sudden, everyone started going on all these ideas. Okay, can we uh, order something here? Can we get something in Montreal? Can we get something in Toronto in the morning? Can we ship something overnight? No, no, no. It's like, okay. Then it started getting a little more out of the box. Can I can I borrow the extra 300 that the uh, NRC had and fly to New York where we knew we had one? Uh, okay, that would be problematic. Can we get someone there to put it on a commercial flight up in the morning Okay, we knew there was one in Brooklyn. No, none of that would work. The flights could never get there in time, and we would lose that flight opportunity. And then someone came up, well, what about Lyft? Like Uber, what about? And so I said, well, give it a try. And so uh, the idea was we were in Ottawa. We had one in Brooklyn. We had to somehow convince a Lyft driver to drive this box to a parking lot at two in the morning, halfway between in <laughs> Syracuse and meet some random people in a parking lot at 2 a.m. in Syracuse. With this mysterious box. The only one that we had there was a six foot five Russian guy with a heavy accent. And and so we're like, all right, give it a try. And uh, <laughs> we talked to, to Nikolai and very soon he called Baga. Yeah, that'll show. Everything is good. You'll be there at two in the morning. So... My friend and I, we got together, we got in a car, we drove five hours over the border, we got there, and sure enough, here was someone with the box. We turned around, we took turns sleeping, we got back, got the unit there at two in the morning, and we're like, Nikolai, how did you convince yeah. somebody to do this? And he's like, it wasn't a problem. Like, the driver was Russian, I'm Russian, I could communicate our problem. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and and then some problem happened with the payment at two in the morning and he was so worried and he didn't speak um, almost no english but i knew just enough russian to communicate yeah. that it wasn't going to be a problem we were going to work it out <laughs> <laughs> there you go i love that i absolutely love that story oh i couldn't imagine i couldn't imagine the, what you guys were going through and how it all came together that, that that is a funny one yeah how fortunate how fortunate that it worked out all right. Well, we are rounding the bend here, Jason, into this very last segment, a crystal ball segment. And based on the, the nature of the work that you do and who you serve, it's probably you know, a safe assumption to make that you're firmly entrenched on this line between you know, new technological advancement and understanding. My question here is kind of a broad question, but what is that like? You, know, you, you constantly have new tech coming out. You have these programs built on you know, technology in a sense. How is it for you managing that aspect, managing that, that, that line? There's so many levels at, at what we do. Some of the main technologies, you know, spacesuits obviously are a good example, but how do you do that? How do you do that safely? Because every step is something novel and something that hasn't been done before. 
And so trying to step by step, test a little, learn a little bit uh, in that process and do so that involves students as researchers, as test subjects themselves. Because what's exciting is that this is what the future of space is going to look like. When you look at one of our classes, everyone's got a different flag on the shoulder. We have near gender parity. You know, we have, you know, active programs engaging people from countries that have never been in space. We have you know, aggressively open to LGBTQ people that have been historically excluded. So this is the future of space. And so the tests that we do uh, are reflecting a demographic that's a lot more germane, I think, to how technologies are going to enable humans uh, because just of the natural diversity of our of our community. So it's not just in this case, it isn't just the suits, but every time we test a suit, zero g there's about 20 other experiments that are going on and some of these we build the institute and some are student experiments uh, that come and many of them come to publication or when we have a eva spacesuit prototype for example we use the gravity offset lab but the students are coming in with their own tool designs or maybe procedures to address a potential medical contingency that could influence spacesuit design and so we're learning a little bit in the field uh so we're next week we'll be in northern arizona Uh, doing this in kind of an analog field, but then we take all those procedures and tools and then apply them in an actual spacesuit in gravity offset, whatever level of gravity we want to simulate in a way that is useful. It's maturing technologies. It's studying human performance and it's, and it's tied together with education. And then all we do for the outreach uh, extends from that education, but it all traces down to the, the worth of the, the research fundamentally. Mm, mm. Interesting. Like I, when I was thinking about this question, you know, I was caught up on the, the, the technical side of it a little bit where even with each technological advancement that comes along, that unto itself becomes this new variable that you have to test for, right? This Each upgrade is a new variable in, in a way. And I thought that would be sort of like an interesting look at it. But in, in terms of how you know, are, this conversation is gone and the types of people, you know, that you have in your programs, you're having different viewpoints, you know, representing all these different groups. You know, I, I think that also plays into it as well, which makes it interesting too. You're getting this wealth of ideas where, where you're not just drawing from a pool traditionally that's maybe coming from money or coming from this one particular background. You're having all these other different viewpoints on all of these things. And again, all these different variables add levels of intrigue and, uh, you know, kind of fuel that passion, I'm guessing, that we spoke about earlier as far as, you know, diving deeper and further into this world and, and advancing a lot of the, the research that comes out of it all. So, yeah, absolutely fascinating. But on that note, I think, uh, you know, we are kind of drawing to a close here, Jason. I've really thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. And I'm certain listeners will as well. So I, I can't thank you enough for all of your time today and all of your wonderful insights. Oh, Christopher, I appreciate, uh, appreciate everything that you're doing here. And um, we got uh, our first research space flight uh, to space coming up here, dedicated flight. So this is something to look forward to. But uh, yeah, be in touch. And thanks for your interest in our work. Well, for those interested in learning more about Jason and his work, you can do so via the astronautsinstitute.org. You can also find him on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and even on YouTube. And for reference, all this information, including links, will be included in the show notes. And finally, I mean, hey, if you like today's show, please be sure to tell a friend and share. To show further support, you can rate, review, and subscribe wherever you access your podcasts. And as mentioned off the top, If you are enjoying this, head on over to YouTube. We do have that channel over there with highlights from these audio versions of the conversations. And if you do like it, a like or subscribe would be greatly appreciated. Finally, don't forget to join us on the next episode of Life As A, where we'll continue to explore and unearth the details of professions and the people behind them. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. Until next time, stay curious about life and living.